everyone's to a degree faking it till they make it. Like, you yeah. know, no one trained me to be a YouTuber. No one trained me to own multiple companies at once. Like, you just kind of start doing it. And then if it fails, you go tweak it and make it work or you kill it. And either way, like, you just keep doing things. And eventually, if you keep doing enough things, something will stick, something will work, something will pop. And you just need to trust that on the other side of like digging that hole, digging that mine, that there are diamonds there. But if what you're trying to accomplish, if someone has ever done it before, know that you can do it as well. Over 1,700 new millionaires are created every single day in the US alone, and more than double that across the globe. They're people from all walks of life, most of them people just like you and I. So the big question is this, how are so many people who didn't inherit money or have any special advantages overcoming the odds and becoming millionaires? That's the question and this show will give you the answers. My name is Jeff Lerner and welcome to Millionaire Secrets. Welcome back to another episode of Millionaire Secrets. If you're seeing this uh, on YouTube on the show, then let me wave hello. If you're listening on the podcast, I appreciate you tuning in. I am here with Matt McKeever, uh, Canadian real estate guru and authority and investor and YouTuber. And if I understand right, ex pharmaceutical worker or consultant or something from that world too. And just generally really smart guy. And, and from the little bit of research that I've done on Matt's business, definitely a long-term thinker, which I'm really excited to talk about. I think we're aligned in that way. Matt, welcome to Millionaire Secrets. Thanks, Jeff. Appreciate it. Really excited to be here. Yeah, yeah. We're glad to have you. Um, so, from the, the research that I've done, uh, you know, I definitely get that you own a significant amount of real estate, which uh, job well done there. A lot of people want to do that. Very few people actually do that. Um, and I don't know if that's because people are just risk averse or uninformed or what, but um, <laughs> it's great having a couple hundred rental units to pay for your life, right? Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't hurt. That's for sure. So definitely happy I got into real estate when I did. I think a lot of people, unfortunately, they want real estate to be a get rich quick scheme. In my opinion, it's a get rich for sure scheme, but there's nothing necessarily quick about it. Yeah. Okay. So I, I'm glad you said that because A, it validates my experience and it, it makes me feel like I didn't do something wrong just because I didn't get rich quick. Um, and yeah, I've been in it for over a decade and and it's great, but it is. It's, it's slow and steady wins the race. Uh, how did you get into real estate? You mentioned you're glad you got in when you did. When was that and what happened? Yeah, so I started investing at the age of 25 back in 2010. So I've been investing in real estate now for about 10 years. And the first property I bought was a student rental property. Mm -hmm. um, bought it. It was underperforming. I actually moved into one of the bedrooms, had some of my buddies move in and house hacked and just lived for free. And so I really accredit a lot of my success to just keeping my cost of living low at the start. When I first got my first real job, started working as a CPA, a chartered accountant here in Canada, and just really focused on trying to maximize my income while minimizing my expenses, growing that gap. And that's what allowed me to take, you know, gambles or risks or investments and business decisions that a lot of my peers couldn't just because between their risk aversion and lack of resources, they just didn't have the resiliency to be able to like jump into it. But what originally got me thinking about uh, real estate investing in the first place, like a lot of people, was the book Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the gateway drug for a lot of us. And my introduction to it actually came in my last year of university. So living in a house with a group of dudes and me and my one buddy, we both knew we wanted to get rich. We just didn't know how, like, you know, in university, you've got a lot of energy and a lot of good intentions, but you don't know really where to point it. And one day we were chatting and we we're like, yeah, we want to be business tycoons. We want to own real estate. You know, we want to be rich. And we're just like, how are we actually going to do that? And finally, I was just like, Jake, your dad's rich. He owns like this big company. He does all this stuff. He's got all these employees. I was like, go ask him how to get rich. 
And so he literally went to his dad and his dad was like, read this book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And then in the back of Rich Dad, Poor Dad back then, there used to be a list of other books they recommended you read. Mm -hmm. And so I just went and read every book. Huh, that's, that's so cool. And that's so funny because literally, that's why I started investing in real estate was because I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. My friend, uh, my friend Jeremy gave me a copy of it. I don't know where he got it. But yeah, he got it. And then we read Cashflow Quadrant. And then we bought the Cashflow board game. I don't know, we were like 20, I don't know, 25 year old guys, 24 year old guys, whatever we were. You know, other people are out drinking and partying on Fridays. And we're literally sitting there playing Cashflow. Like the biggest nerds, but also <laughs> yeah. I'm really glad. Like it, it worked out. Absolutely. But, but it was hard too. And I, I'm, I'd like to talk more about this because you mentioned keeping your expenses low. You mentioned you started working as a CPA, so you had some income. So obviously you were able to create a gap to work with, right? A gap of, of between costs and, and income. Um, for me, I was, a, uh, I, was a, I was a jazz piano player in my 20s. So I was like, I was poor. I was like straight up <laughs> poor. I mean, I was working for tips some nights. Some gigs they paid me in food. Like I'd yeah. play at the restaurant and I'd play for four hours and they'd give me a plate of dinner and that was my, the gig. I mean, those were, that was early when I started, but, um, it, you know, it, it was hard without steady, predictable, consistent, positive margin income to make, you know, f to feel secure making these kind of big bets because even, you know, even 5% down on a decent property, you're mm -hmm. still having to come up with 10 grand, right? Which to a musician that makes $37,000 a year or whatever is like scary and, and hard. And so I'm curious, you teach a lot about real estate. I mean, you, you have a big YouTube channel. I, I, you run a meetup. I, you do, you do live events. I assume you speak at conferences. Yeah, yeah. It's so like, what is your, how do you talk to people about a, the psychology of getting comfortable with the risk and be just the practicality of trying to squeeze money out when frankly, most people kind of suck at what you said, which is living cheap. Living yeah, cheap, right? it, it's definitely a very valid point. And I definitely come across the limiting belief from people all the time that they have to be rich in order to start investing or in order to succeed in real estate investing, you have to already be rich. Yeah. So the first thing I think that we need to really parse out is how risky is it really? And so certainly there's different levels of risk depending upon the investment strategy you're trying to implement. And what I teach and really try and push people to learn is focusing on the fundamentals when it comes to real estate. So one of the areas people often get burned is when they're focusing on speculation. And speculation is really just what I'd like to consider the greater fool theory. And that's, I'm going to pay a bunch of money for something, but someone else will come along and pay me more money for it. Mm -hmm. And that's what we see in a lot of different asset classes whenever kind of bubbles start to form, right? Just a dog pile in where more and more money starts chasing less and less resources without necessarily a lot of fundamentals behind it. So I really focus on cash flowing rental properties. And so based upon the fundamentals of the markets I'm often investing in, we're focusing on things like affordability. So right now, the apartments I rent and I own here in uh, London, Ontario specifically, are at a price point where literally two full-time minimum wage earners could afford to rent out my two-bedroom apartment units. And so from an affordability standpoint, it's a very robust business model because I'm right kind of near the floor of the entry level when it comes to rentals. So regardless of what economy is going on, there's always going to be a certain level of demand for that asset class. So realistically, when people start thinking about buying a property, when they start having their emotions hijack their thinking, they start thinking, what if it goes to zero? I'm going to buy this $200,000 asset or this half a million dollar asset. And what happens if it goes to zero? Well, realistically, if we've done any basic due diligence, it's not going to zero. It's not like a paper stock that in theory, it could turn out the owners were embezzling and all the assets are fake and they don't exist anymore. So in fact, there's some basic level like value to it. You know, often we could look at like, what's the replacement cost? What would it cost to rebuild this property, right? And that sometimes can be an indication of potentially the value in the property or what would at least this lot sell for? You know, the house can burn down, but the land's still gonna be there. So oftentimes I like to really get people to focus on the realistic worst case scenario rather than the absolute worst case scenario. And the realistic worst case scenario for a lot of real estate investors 
is they don't make as much cash flow as they wanted. They maybe break even. And that's not ideal, but from a learning perspective, think about you spend, well, in the United States, you guys spend a lot more to go to university. So like you might drop fifty, sixty thousand dollars in Canada, or maybe a hundred thousand or two hundred thousand in the States to go to university. And that's on an investment that has no guarantee of paying off either. And yet people think of that as the safest investment there is, but it's completely up to you to decide what you make of that investment in your education. And with real estate investing, if we're investing on fundamentals, often we're in the driver's seat, we're in control, we can pivot our business model, we can ebb and flow with the market and figure out ways to minimize our downside and risk. Yeah, I, I, I like what you're saying. Again, I'm, you know, I'm what I would consider a, an advanced dilettante at real estate investing. Like I'm, I'm, you know, I own counting apartments and stuff, probably 25 rental units, uh, units, not properties, right? Yeah. Maybe 20, 28 or something. Cause I have one that's nine and one that's six and then a bunch of single family and duplex kind of stuff. So and I, I, sometimes it's funny you say this because I'm feeling really encouraged by what you say because by no means do I consider myself an expert, so I still have insecurity, let's say. But two things you said really stood out to me. One is with real estate investing, cash flow may not be what you hoped. Vacancy, you know, over a period of time, vacancies could be higher. There could be more maintenance. Like I had one property where... I had to replace, there was a hailstorm. I had to replace, you know, it was like $20,000 to replace the roof and insurance somehow came in and said they would only cover 7,500 of it. And it's like, oh, there goes all my profit for two years. Or It's just like, mm -hmm. I was always stuff. But at the same time, I look at it and I say, listen, over a long period of time, I, th I suspect on my base of properties as a whole, which I wasn't an advanced investor. I'm sure I could have done better. I'm sure I overpaid sometimes. I probably pretty close to broke even cash flow wise. I'm sure mm -hmm. I, you know, I think I make like, I mean, on 25, 27 units, I'd probably make like, you know, 10 or 12 grand a year. Like it's nothing, I couldn't live off it. Right. But I've got uh, the single, probably single biggest asset I have is the combined mm -hmm. equity in all those properties. And I didn't have to pay for that. Somebody else's money paid for that. And so over, and I've had, I mean, that, I started when I had no money. I took some risks. I had a couple of properties foreclosed. It screwed up my credit for a while. Like I haven't been a perfect record, but over the long haul, it's like you said, get rich, not get rich quick, get rich for sure. I've sucked at it. I've made a lot of mistakes. And yet over the 15 years that I've been doing it, it's still the biggest asset I have. I've, even when I was breaking even on cash flow, I was saving money on taxes because I've been collecting the depreciation every year. Like, it, it, so, A, I'm super validated there that I'm not a failure just because my cash flow hasn't been what I hoped. And, and I say that as encouragement for everybody listening. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm proof you can be bad at this thing. And it's still a great thing. And it's still a lot better than, like you say, the stock market or 401ks or all this stuff that, I mean, people have been getting rocked in cyclically for years. And the other thing is focusing on rental properties that have a very broad affordability, mm -hmm. which I think, you know, I know a lot of people that have, when I show them my pro, I'll show them a picture of like, Hey, I own this little apartment complex. And they kind of almost like, so what, who cares? Like they thumb their nose at it. Yeah. Cause it's like, we, you know, one of the, a two bedroom unit in it is like $775 a month us. And like, Oh, that's not a premium property. And I'm like, dude, your property you may tell me it's worth $800,000, but good luck renting it to pay your note. Mm -hmm. My st I got six units that rent for $700 a piece on a $250,000 property. That's yeah. actually a way better cap rate. That's a way better Absolutely. deal economics, especially if you're trying to get into this and you don't have deep pockets, you know? So I'm feeling very vindicated by what you're saying. And I hope that I can pass that on to the, the audience as encouragement that if you start small, if you don't let your ego and your emotion, like you say, drive your decision making, you can suck at this thing and still come out ahead like I have over a long period of time. And, and that, or you could be like Matt and crush it and, you know, be a guru, but Either way, yeah. it's a win, right? Yeah, absolutely. And again, it really just comes down to understanding with real estate, we often get to be in the driver's seat. So like, there's a common saying we use on my channel, data 
over drama or data versus drama. And so it really comes down to just like focusing on the data. And so there's a lot of drama. And so the drama that enters the equation when you're thinking about real estate investing is when your parents are like, oh, you're going to become a real estate investor. Enjoy unclogging toilets at 2 a.m. Well, I can tell you, I've never had to go at 2 a.m. to unclog a toilet. There's always a solution that you can focus on in order to solve whatever problem you come across. But it really is up to us to make sure that we're taking ownership. And now to your second question about for those investors that or aspiring investors that maybe don't have a lot of money. Again, at some point in time, if you truly want to become a successful investor, you'll stop using your own money. So I literally have a rule for myself now. I don't use a single dollar of Matt McKeever's money to buy real estate. And uh, in, in part because it's part of my long-term goal, but also to prove a point to some yeah. YouTube fans, we set up a new corporation and uh, I haven't literally put a single dollar into that corporation. And over the course of the last eight months, we've acquired 70 units just in that new corporation. And so that's all just from other people's money, other people's resources. And the thing that a lot of aspiring investors get wrong is they, they find a property and try and get investors for it rather than getting a deal. And there's actually a big difference. So like you can't just buy any real estate property and expect to get rich off of it. You need to actually focus on the data, the fundamentals behind it. So we're always focused on buying, you know, under undervalued, underutilized assets and bringing them up to their highest, best, most efficient use. It's really a very simple, basic business model, but it works really well because we're always buying at a fraction of the potential value of that property. So we're often buying properties that are under rented by on average between 25 and 50% of their potential rent. So if you can get in there and turn over those assets, you can really add a lot of value as well as increase your cash flow in that regards. Now, when you go looking for investors on a project like that, it's not that hard to find people that want to buy in on an opportunity or lend you money when you're buying a property with built-in equity. The problem is when you're paying fair market value, or sometimes I see new investors get bullied by realtors who are a little bit unscrupulous and they end up buying overpaying for a property that doesn't cash flow, that's an actual bad investment, and then they're trying to find investors for it. Again, what investor wants to invest in a bad business. And real estate is literally just a very simple business. It's a box on land. That's all you need to think about it as. And so it's a very simple business, a business that's been around for a really long time. But again, if we don't treat it like a business, if we let our emotions hijack us and we're like, I love the area, or I love the landscape, or I just think it's pretty. Those are very dangerous things. The moment you start hearing yourself saying, I feel, when it comes to real estate investing, you're in trouble. You've gone to the dark side. Would you say, would you say that's also true with the word, I think? Yeah, because it really should be, I know, right? Like, Hey, I know that these three other properties on this street in the last three months during COVID sold for this price. So I know that fair market value should be somewhere in this range. Right. Again, there's no such thing as a hundred percent certainty when it comes to real estate, because real estate is a location, location, location. And each property is going to be mildly unique to itself. But certainly with enough data, we can really reduce the risks. And that's where a lot of people are going into real estate based upon feelings or speculation or fear of missing out. There's a lot of that in Canada right now. And it's why we have such high debt ratios and why the affordability and so many people are struggling because they're, they're scared they're never going to get a chance to get into the real estate market. And they're making bad decisions because of it. And they're letting drama hijack their thinking process. I like that a lot. Data over drama that in a way that's, you know, I teach people uh, di digital business, you know, various online business models, three of them in particular that we really teach at my company. And I, we could, I'm, I'm probably going to hijack that, that uh, principle yeah. data, data over drama. Cause yeah, people are like, well, you know, my landing page is ugly. I'm like, but it, it converts work. at 60%. Who cares? You know, if you want to add a doily little graphic and kill conversions or slow down the page load speed or what, I mean, have fun with mm -hmm. that, but I'd rather make money, you know? <laughs> um, yeah. So, okay. So that's really cool. So, so you have set out and, and I totally get what you're saying on principle of doing real estate investing without using your own money, even though at this point you actually probably have your own money that you could use because you're trying to illustrate a point. So obviously part of that is, and I'm glad we're talking about this because I, 
you know, I don't know if it's my, my audience or if it's just the subset of my audience that reaches out to me the most. I suspect it's the latter. But the, the people I get direct messages from are people that are basically saying, what do I do? I don't have a lot of resources. Some of them are like 17-year-old kids. They're like, my, mm -hmm. I'm, I live with my parents. They tell me that they have to go to college. There's no other options for me, but I struggle in school. I don't know what to do. Da, da. And, you know, they don't have a lot of money. And, but, and maybe they're 17. They don't, there's nothing they can do. But in a year or two, there will be. But I got to think with what you're saying, if you're talking about going out and buying real estate without money, which means really buying real estate, leveraging other people's money, that part of that is knowing how to put a proposal together, put a, an investment package together to actually go get somebody who has the money to put up their money. Yeah, absolutely. And again, I see a lot of investors do that process wrong. So oftentimes when an investor does get an opportunity, when they cite a deal, when they've got some data backing up the opportunity, their thought process immediately gets hijacked and they start thinking me, me, me and I, I, I. And so they start talking about what a great deal they're going to get. They're going to they're, keep talking about how much money they're going to make. Mm -hmm. And r way too often, I'll see a new investor that has no resources, that has a legitimate opportunity where I know that they stand to make money by doing the deal. And then they start getting scared about what size, what piece of the pie they're going to get and what piece they have to give up. At the very start of your investing journey, especially if you don't have any resources yourself. So it definitely is helpful if you have some resources because you can do your first deal or two and get that proof of concept. And then you can market the proof of concept when yeah. you've literally never done a deal before. What you need to focus on is not how much money you're going to make on the first deal, but doing the first deal and proving that someone made money on it. Again, if you like my, my advice, honestly, if you're struggling and you've got a real opportunity, don't be afraid to take 10% of the profit and give 90% to your money partner and just tell them, Hey, this is going to be like my showcase deal. I'm going to build my entire business model off of this. So you can guarantee yourself that I'm going to make you money. Cause I have to, because my entire future is based upon this. And if you can take that mindset to it, understand that once you start making someone money, they get addicted to you. I've got money partners that chase me now because they want me to go make them more money. And it's simply because we focused on building a relationship over transactions, which is another big common theme on my YouTube channel, because a lot of people are focused on the transaction. And we see this all the time with internet gurus and fly by night salesmen and, you know, gurus that have never really done it. And everyone's just focused on like, I just want to make my immediate rip. Mm. I'm in the empire business. And if you're in this for longevity, you want your reputation to precede you in a good way. I want my reputation to precede me where every business partner is like, Matt does good, fair, honest business. Oh, and he makes his partners a buttload of money. Man, that's, uh, you're younger than me. So this may sound like a pretentious dad statement, but you're a wise young man. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I appreciate that. Uh, no, I mean, it's true, man. The, the long game. And, and I, I'm glad to hear that the, the short term, you know, myopic thinking isn't just an internet thing. It's also a real estate thing. Cause I'm an, I'm on the internet doing and saying the same thing. Frankly, it's why I started this podcast. Yeah. I, I mean, podcasting is almost as bad a business model as a YouTube channel, at least yes, in the first, is. at least in the first two years. Right. Mm -hmm. But it's about relationships. My audience knows that I am committed to helping them find the millionaire secret because I have a show called Millionaire Secrets. It's going to put out hundreds of explorations of millionaires and their secrets. And, and so, and you know, and that those relationships become currency over time. Yes. And yeah. if I could just riff on that a little bit, yeah. like personally, I invest in a lot of different businesses. I've got a lot of different active businesses, but I truly believe that my best investments and what I'm going to be known for truly is some of the people I'm currently mentoring. So I like my business, like my overall business structure is very uh, unusual compared to the corporate world. I kind of came up in through, you know, the CPA background and then working as a financial controller for a publicly traded pharmaceutical company. But I actually like most of my, most of my close employees I expect are going to work with me and become partners of mine over several decades. And I don't know if Matt McKeever goes on to become, you know, have the level of impact that I aspire to, but I know if I don't, they will. And that to me is that sort of long-term thinking that's just been lost. And again, there are exceptions to it, but it really feels like a lot of people these days, they want to immediately flex on Instagram about how great their lifestyle is and just become a lifestyle guru without 
ever having lived life. And it's really just about enjoying the journey and the experience. And you, the moment you start thinking long term, it becomes so much easier to do that because you stop comparing yourself on the individual basis over everything. Because you start to realize like, oh, like I don't understand the big picture of that person's life. So they may have a great front, but it could com be completely rotten on the inside or it may be amazing. But again, if it's amazing on the outside and inside, they work towards that. No one gave them that. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned flexing on Instagram. I had, uh, oh, just, I mean, so I started, I completely ignored Instagram. I've been online for almost, well, since 2008. I mean, I've been online, I think, longer than Instagram. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and, and it was literally until last year, Instagram was this just like very annoying, off-putting thing to me. Like it is, it's all just all show, no go. Like I, I know these people are like, I mean, you can't, ca you can't pay your bills with followers and, and the, you know, half of them are like spending all their money on a photographer and, you know, post-production editing. And like, they're like, they make $200,000 a year and they have $180,000 a year media production team making them look good all the time. It's like, that's, that's not a life, man. That you, you, it's fun when you're single, I guess, but like, I hope you never get married and try to have kids because what, then you're going to have the photographers in your house and like, anyway, I'm glad you said that. But I, uh, I, I finally, I finally did come around. So now I get all these people on Instagram that are like, well, that doesn't look like you must not really be who you say you are or you'd have a bigger house. Yeah. I'm like, I rent my house. When I buy property, Same. it's rental pro it's it's property other people are going to rent. Why would I go drop $10,000 a month to rent? I live in Southern Utah. Like who am I trying to impress, you know? And I think you're right, man. That long-term thinking is the internet has created this this psychology of envy where everybody, you know, we talk about keeping up with the Joneses, it's worse mm -hmm. online than it ever was in suburbia. Yes, absolutely agree. And again, like when I originally got exposed to Rich Dad, Poor Dad, one of the books I read right after it was The Millionaire Next Door. Mm -hmm. And so Dr. Stanley in that book does an amazing job of really breaking down what millionaires actually look like. And the average millionaire looks way different than what society and media has led us to believe. And it's really important because, you know, for maybe your more experienced audience, it's like, obviously, man, right. I know the guy driving that Beamer doesn't necessarily make or save the money he uh, does make. But no, for a lot of like impressionable 17, 18, 19 year olds, they think that uh, the reflection of reality that's painted by these people literally reflects the true the true financial picture for them. And that's not the case for the vast majority of people. And I can tell you that based upon my experience when I was in public accounting, I worked on a lot of high net worth individuals. And we also had a lot of high income individuals. And they're not necessarily the same people. High income individuals can spend just as much or even more than what they make. There's a lot of doctors and lawyers that are living paycheck to paycheck. And there's a lot of farmers and just, you know, blue collar business owners that make a lot of money and keep a lot of money. And it really is about when we're talking about personal finances, it's not what you gross, it's what you net. You mentioned farmers. I, one of the biggest revelations for me, I live in Utah. There's a lot of, you know, you drive 50 miles in any direction and it's agriculture and stuff. So your average farmer is probably a million, probably a real estate millionaire. Yep. Any gets out and wears overalls and looks dirty and has calluses on his hands and everything. And he's a real estate millionaire because he's got 400 acres of cash flow positive land or whatever, you know, it mm -hmm. is. I'm, gl I'm glad we're talking about this. I think that million, you know, one of the millionaire secrets that I would, I would love to really clarify through this show is that being a millionaire isn't about looking like a millionaire. There's no such mm -hmm. thing to look like, uh, um, it's like saying, oh, I don't know, look, he looks like a human or like, what, what does that even mean? There's people that would judge you and be like, well, oh, if he was really a millionaire, wh why doesn't he shave? Yeah, no, dude, right? I get so many judgments <laughs> on the daily basis, but the truly funny thing is, at least for like the ultra high net worth individuals I know, the richer they get, the less their appearance matters to them. And so like, literally like, some of the dudes I know that are worth the most 
only ever in shorts and flip flops or only ever rocking sweatpants and a t-shirt. And it's because yeah. like they're at the level now where they just don't care. Like they'll still take the meeting, but like they're no longer putting on the custom fitted suit because they don't need to. And it, it doesn't necessarily align with their personality. So like, you know, we've got the custom tailored suits and we wear them when appropriate. But to me, it's not my default state. So I'm not rocking it all the time. And I think it's, it really comes down to your comfort level. The people that are only ever posting photos of their vehicles or their significant other or the house they live in or rent or whatever, those are the people that are insecure. It's the people that really show you their entire life. You yeah. know, like the parts that aren't as pretty, those are the people that are very comfortable. Those are the people that I'm probably more likely to trust that they, if I see a flex by them, that it's probably actually backed up by reality. Well, I'm not saying I'm a billionaire or anything, but I will say this. Lululemon shirt, Lululemon shorts, and my black rubber Birkenstocks, 100% of the time that I'm not going to like a formal event, that's it. Yeah. That's all. I, I have a couple different, I have, I have different colors. That's as much as I want to, I, I've even considered going like full Steve Jobs. Mm -hmm. Just wearing the same thing every day. Because you know what the worst part of my day is? Is going in the closet. Even my wife, she makes fun of me because like, like these shorts, these like blue camo short, they're like, I don't know if you can see, but they have like a blue camo pattern. This morning I had on a, a purple t-shirt and she's like, that doesn't match. And I'm like, yeah, but babe, nobody's going to see me. They're going to see me from like the ribs up today. And she's like, well, you always tell me you want me to tell you. And I'm like, fine, what should I wear? And she's like, just go with black. That's yeah. like the most, that's the most unpleasant part of my day. You know, it's just so funny the world we live in. And I hope a lot of young people too, they, I feel like they really need to hear this. Like they really need to own what we're saying, man. You'll save mm -hmm. yourself decades of grief and tens of thousands of dollars of therapy and many bad relationships where people are interested in you for the wrong reasons and a whole lot of wasted money that sets you back for years and years and years because you're trying to impress people. Like if you just hear this one moment of this conversation, right? Yeah, a hundred percent agree. And so maybe just one last point I'd love to make for your audience is uh, at least in regards to appearances. Uh, for those of you just listening, like I have a ridiculously long beard. It's, you know, I don't know, six, eight inches long at least. And uh, a lot of people question why I wear it or why I have it. And to me, one, it just kind of started off as an experiment. But two, my team actually knows this and I regularly make jokes. This is my version of a face tattoo. It's actually a great way to sort whether someone actually has good intentions or bad intentions. Mm -hmm. Like the people that are going to immediately comment or judge me based upon my appearance, like oh, those are people that long-term probably aren't going to align with me anyways or my long-term thinking or approach to life. Where the people that like are like, you know, want to explore ideas and ideas like businesses and passions and things of that nature, those are the people that I want to have conversations with, not the person that's like, oh man, like you need to go to this stylist or you need to use this beer wax or, or this beard wax or whatever. So it's like, no man, like this is all just a thing. So mind you, I don't actually want a face tattoo because it's permanent where a beard is kind of nice and flexible. But I have noticed that a lot of celebrities and successful individuals at some point, they decide to like really push themselves outside their comfort zone whether that's like shaving their head, dyeing their hair, completely doing a 180 on their wardrobe, they sometimes like invite the attention and hate to almost get accustomed to it. And you kind of build up those calluses and experience. And so for myself, this is literally part of that process, in my opinion. Oh, that's, that's really interesting. Yeah, it's like full, uh, they go like full Jim Carrey almost, just like yeah. off the deep end. Like, I don't care what anybody thinks. And yeah, it's, it's funny that, that whole, yeah, there's a whole other conversation there. Um, so yeah. And by the way, if you want to, if you want to develop, like I, I look at it this way and I'm sure you can relate to this when you become visible on social media, it either destroys you or it forces you to become the most resilient version of yourself. Yeah, absolutely. And sometimes it's going to do both. Like, Again, like there's ebbs and flows to it. So uh, definitely in the long-term picture, the value is so much there and being able to have mind share and being able to build a personal brand and being able to garner someone's attention. Like it, it's almost priceless in my opinion, but it can come with its downsides and consequences and negativity. Like I've had 
people that just hate on me that choose to literally look up every property I own and call the property inspector and just put in anonymous complaints so that then you got to jump through a bunch of red tape and pain in the ass factors and things of that wow. nature. But then you learn just to stop buying property in your personal name and you yeah. set up corporations and you make it hard for them to track. Um, so again, we've got a, a, a saying we use all the time, problems or profits. And that's how you're going to approach everything in life. It's, it's either a problem or it's a profit center and an opportunity. And it's really up to us to choose whether we're going to take ownership of the situation. If you take ownership of the situation, you can fix that problem and turn it into a profit center. But if you're going to become a victim, if life's going to happen to you rather than you happen to life, then you're going to always hit some sort of roadblock. There's always going to be some sort of obstacle. Because even if myself or Jeff could give you the silver bullet to your problem today, there's another problem hiding right behind the problem you're currently facing. So it really is about a mindset and just understanding to enjoy that journey. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. You know, one, one of the things that, that our company, I think, is kind of unique about with the way we talk about digital, uh, we talk about online business, is we actually use the term developing digital real estate. Because yep. I, I think of really, you know, these screens right here, to me, they're just vertical orientation land. Mm -hmm. yeah, the only, and that, that also doesn't have a finite supply. But I mean, it's, it's you're building assets. And, and I try to get people thinking the same way, that you want to you create properties online. Yeah. That, yeah. If, if I could just riff off of that for a second. Yeah, so, please, please. Uh, like a lot of people, I invest in myself. I pay for high-end mentorships and mastermind events. And one of my mentors you know, uh, we went and flew down to Texas to meet with him and he's built up and has an, a nine figure net worth. So very successful man, done very well for himself. And we were out at dinner and we were discussing the why I was doing YouTube. And so just full transparency, because that's one of my core personal values is I spend about 20, 25 grand a month on my social media endeavors and straight up the direct monetization is about five grand. So yeah. there's about a 20 K a month burn there. That's not uh, covered. Now I get all sorts of tangential benefits and real estate deals that come from it. So it could justify it. But I was walking through with this mentor, my logic and kind of my thought process. And I view it really much as we're in this digital age, we're just approaching the time of like cable TV. So, you know, there used to be three or three broadcast stations right back in the days of TV. Then cable TV came out, specialty channels and all that. And there was this huge gold rush or land rush. And all of a sudden something clicked in him and he just looked at me and it's like, so you're telling me you're buying beachfront property in Malibu in the sixties. I was like, I don't really understand the reference, but yes, I think that's what I'm doing. <laughs> and he was like, okay. He's like, I get it. And like immediately they decided to start investing a little bit more in themselves because they're like, you know, let's take a flyer on this. Let's do that little bit of investment and see what happens with mm -hmm. trying to gain some mind share because they, they're not social media dudes. They're just business dudes. Yeah, I, I mean, I look at, at YouTube the exact same way. That is, my, that is my real social media real estate play. Everything else is, uh, you know, it's like, it's like an Airbnb. Like I, I lease it for, you know, you think about putting a piece of content on Instagram. It's literally, it's like an overnight yeah. thing and it's gone. But YouTube, you know, it's every month I check the stats and, you know, I'm, I'm way earlier stage than you are in YouTube, but you see it building, man. And any time, and this is, this is a principle that I, I will share, whether it has anything to do with YouTube or, I mean, it has a lot. To, it always is fundamental in real estate. Like when you can get your hooks into something that you can see compounding over a long period of time, what, whatever it is, right? I don't mm -hmm. care if it's a, it's a you know, whole life insurance policy or, or a rental property or a YouTube channel. Those are the things that you want to, start early and nurture for a long time and everything else in your life, I think you fit around it to make sure that your bills are paid, make sure that you, your lights stay on, get as lean as possible, but just invest in things that, yeah, like you're saying, man, are, are that where you're the only one that sees it. If you're the only one that sees it, it's actually maybe the right thing. If everybody else sees it, it's already too late. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you don't want to be in the ocean that everyone sees, right? You want to find those deep niches that are still blue ocean. 
So, so what do you say to a guy who comes to you now who's, you know, never mind his, his actual numerical age, but just young in, in a business sense, doesn't necessarily have a ton of capital, um, has a lot of drive. What, what do you, where do you direct them now as, a, as the place to start trying to get traction? Yeah. So regardless of your business or niche or your long-term aspirations, and this is going to sound funny coming from an accountant, but get good at sales. And so like in my corporate days, you know, like accounting and sales and marketing, we often don't see eye to eye and we're often actually battling it out because I'm like, why did you spend all this money on this stupid shit? Like, I don't understand the ROI. You can't show me a spreadsheet that proves it. But when you're actually looking at being an entrepreneur or just you want to develop a high earning potential, sales is one of the best skill sets there is because everything in life is a sale. And if you don't think that you're being, if you don't think that you're selling someone, understand that they're selling you in that moment. And so whether it's you're trying to get a date, you're trying to buy that car, you're trying to start a business, you're trying to land your first customer or contract, it all comes down to being able to communicate and interact with people. And while social media has made it very easy for a lot of us to be able to interact on a superficial level, a lot of people have really lost the art of negotiation and being able to build rapport and really just get someone to like them. If you can get in the business of making people like you, people will do a lot of things for you. They'll go the extra mile. And understanding just some basic principles in that can be very powerful. Now, a lot of the young individuals that come to me, they naturally want to get into real estate investing because that's kind of the niche that I built my initial wealth on. And in my opinion there, either become a realtor and get really good at sales because again, you can do that as a realtor and earn a high income or alternatively become a wholesaler, which is kind of like, you know, finding private deals off market deals, very popular in the U S it's just starting to become popular here in Canada. It's quite funny. We're usually four to five years behind. So literally if I want to be an innovator, I can just look to what America was doing like four years ago, implement it. And all of a sudden, like, you know, I'm a Canadian innovator, but get good at sales. If you can get good at sales, you'll always be able to earn your living and you'll always be able to you'll just be able to win more in life, in my opinion, because again, there's always a sale happening. And if you're not the one selling, you're being sold. Yeah. Somebody once told me this may be a crude way to put it, but you're either the, you're always either the fist or the face. <laughs> and if you, if you aren't sure, that means you're the face. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That seems reasonable to me. Yeah. So yeah, I would say just go get good at sales, get good at interacting with people, get good at making friends. Um, Cause again, like, another saying that we say all the time is your network is your net worth. I'm a huge believer of that because you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. Or again, you're just a goldfish in a bowl. If that bowl's too small, you'll never be able to outgrow it. So it's really important that you're constantly surrounding yourself with like-minded individuals that push and compel you to become a better version of yourself because most people are just average and they're focused on being average and that's their goal. And so once they get to average or they're on the pace for average, they're like crabs in a bucket and they'll keep pulling you back to the mean. They'll pull you back to the median line. They just want you to be an average crab like them. So understand that if your environment isn't conductive to personal development, to success, to going the extra mile, either you're going to have to find a way to reduce that friction or you're just going to have to overcome it through sheer effort and belief and commitment. In general, I like to view myself as kind of lazy. So I'm very careful about my environment. So I try and reduce any unnecessary friction. To this day, my parents think I'm still crazy for real estate investing. Like they still think I'm going to lose everything because they're just so risk adverse and they live in their little bubble. Never mind the fact that my sisters worked for me full time for three years. I haven't bounced her paycheck yet. They still live in that scarcity mindset where they're always just like, you bought another property? Why would you do that? Like, didn't you just buy one? And it's just like, that, that's the whole goal. Hmm. That's, yeah, that's interesting and not unique in my experience. Yeah. <laughs> For those of us, I mean, I, there's a, my parents are actually amazingly supportive, I think, of what I do. But on a more extended basis, my family, a lot of them, I think, think I'm kind of out there. You know, I'm, I'm, and I'm like, it really, it's just real estate. I don't even see a big difference between what I do on the internet and what I do with real estate. I'm better at the internet because I'm just more studied and practiced. But I mean, I just invested in a domain for this podcast for Millionaire Secrets. I just I bought MillionaireSecrets.com 
so that I could host all the episodes, I could build out some interactive tools, and that was 25 grand for the domain. People, why would you spend 25, why didn't you just be millionairesecrets.biz or something? I'm like, yeah. nope, I wanted the dot com, it has certain fundamentals like, you know, SEO, val you know, values for dot coms and market values, it just, there's all reason, if I have to explain it to you, you wouldn't understand anyways. Trust me, it was a good investment. And I'm gonna, mm -hmm. and the thing is, I'm gonna take that domain and I'm gonna develop it. Just like people buy land and they build a shopping mall. You know, and I, and I just, you're right. There's people that just think that all that talk is nonsense and that it's craziness and that it's recklessness and that I'm ruined, you know, I'm, how could, how, you have four kids. How, how could you be so reckless, you know? But that's fine. It, it's not, it, here's the thing. If everybody was trying to do what we're trying to do all the time, It'd be a lot more competitive. It'd be a lot harder to get noticed. It'd be a lot harder to find good deals. It'd just it'd be a lot harder, right? Um, yeah, and I think one thing that you find with success often is like, I don't know if you've done these sort of meetings or if you used to give your time out, Jeff, but I definitely used to just say yes to every meeting that was asked of me. Eventually it became impractical. But like, there's times that I would literally spend an hour or two hours pouring out every secret I got, every silver bullet, I'd lay out the exact blueprint. Hey man, if I was in your exact position, this is what I'd do over the course of five years to get control of my financial life. And 99% of people are going to decide that sounds like work and they're just going to, they're never going to do it. Right. So like it far too often, we have this sense that the idea is special or that it's the scarcity of like, you have to come up with this perfect idea or, you know, you've got the perfect idea. It, it's not until you start implementing like, I would rather have someone that just is a hard worker or is just fast to implement rather than someone that's super creative or could come up with the perfect domain name. It's like, no, like, okay, this is a good name. Let's buy it. Let's move on. Let's do this. Let's yeah. build the business now rather than spend years or decades planning the perfect business. Yeah. A a amen to that. I, uh, <laughs> it's funny you say that. I actually just today, my, uh, my assistant went and got a cheap, iPhone 7. So I have a, I have like an iPhone. What, what are the new ones? Like 11s? 11. Yeah. She somehow, I guess, cause they're discontinuing iPhone sevens. She got one for $5. <laughs> I guess you have to sign a contract some with on the, the, the cellular plan or something, but we got the actual phone for $5 and we swapped the SIM card from my phone to, to that phone. So my phone now I have a number that no one has. And my old like number, it. She now has it. So if people text me, and I'm like, obviously I gave it to my wife, I gave it to my, my parents. You know, I think I've given it out now, my kid, my, my boys, I think like seven people have it now. So I just eliminated, you know, I've had that, I had that number since I was 16 years old. I've had it for 25 years. Yeah, no, I'm grinning ear to ear right now because I'm literally, my phone like became a brick in the last couple of days. So I need to go get a new one. And I'm just like, I'm going to do what you did, Jeff, because I've already handed off to my assistant my emails. So yeah. literally every email account I have, she reads and filters before it ever gets to me. And I'm like, dude, I, like, it never even crossed my mind that I could just give her my phone. Just and be swap like, this the is your problem card. now. Yeah. Or I guess this is if your, your problem now. Dead, yeah, give it to No, I mean, it was, and that, it's like you just said, it was the last domino to fall for me. My DMs, my Facebook Messenger, my Instagram DMs, my, even the comments on my YouTube channel, my email. Uh, all of Entra support tickets and now my phone because yeah. of what you just said because and, and this is you know begin with the end in mind again I'm always you know it's fun for you and me to talk and like we go to lunch someday and talk about all the problems of scaling a information marketing business but like for everybody else listening there really is a concept of begin with the end in mind like mm -hmm. Act as if, like act as if there are a lot more people making demands on your time than maybe there are right now. Act as if your information and your time are a lot more valuable than maybe you really think they are right now because it will change the decisions you make. It will change the, the things you tolerate in your life, even to the point where now I won't even tolerate getting a text message from somebody that I'm not related to or in business with or very close friends with. Mm -hmm. And I've eliminated it even as a possibility because I no longer have that phone number, right? Yeah. Like, some people might think that sounds arrogant. It's not. It's what you said. Most of the world isn't trying to do mm -hmm. what you're probably trying to do if you're listening to a show called Millionaire Secrets. 
Exactly. And you have to take a stand now. Don't wait until you feel like you're entitled to do it. Yep. Like one thing that, you know, I continue to learn the more and more uh, I go down the path of life is just like everyone's to a degree faking it till they make it. Like, you know, no one trained me to be a YouTuber. No one trained me to own multiple companies at once. Like you just kind of start doing it. And then if it fails, you go tweak it and make it work or you kill it. And either way, like you just keep doing things. And eventually if you keep doing enough things, something will stick, something will work, something will pop. And you just need to trust that on the other side of like digging that hole, digging that mine, that there are diamonds there. But if what you're trying to accomplish, if someone has ever done it before, know that you can do it as well. So yes, amen to that. And I love that you said tactically, if you, if you have no other obvious place to start, the place to start is learn to sell. And, and, and I, I wholeheartedly agree. Um, you know, I was a, I was a jazz piano player and then I suddenly started making, you know, I paid off almost half a million dollars in debt in 18 months on the internet. And people are always like, well, how, what'd you do? What'd you sell? You know, what, the reality is what I sold was I sold a funnel that led into a, a training product. And then on the back end of that training product, I would call up every buyer of that training product and t tell them about this financial education, these conferences that they could go to that had, frankly, pretty high price tags. And I, I, I say this because the, the, the unwritten subtext of my story, my story is like, well, Jeff was broke and he paid off all his debt with affiliate marketing, is that I wasn't just doing what a lot of people think of as affiliate marketing, which is like, oh, I just send links to, I send traffic to links and they buy and I get paid and I never, you know, it's totally anonymous, right? No, mm -hmm. I was calling up every single buyer and I was upselling them, trying to, on ten and $20,000 financial education packages over the phone. So I didn't make a lot of money because I was great at affiliate marketing. I made a lot of money because I was good at affiliate marketing and I was really good at selling on the phone. Mm -hmm. To your point, right? Yeah, like, no, sales, absolutely. Sales, man, sales saved my life. Yeah. It, it's such a powerful skill set. And it's unfortunate that a lot of society and the media portray, us, pro, portray salesmen in this really negative light, that they're vampires, that they're leeches, that you know, they take advantage of people. They're just good at communicating. Yeah. And it's unfortunate that a lot of us are really poor at expressing ourselves. I heard recently, I assume it's a correct stati statistic, but I heard the statistic, maybe it's fake, that the average person spends about 13 minutes a day talking out loud. And I was like, even if that's close to the truth, that's, that's not enough to get good at sales. That's not enough to wow. be good at expressing yourself and communicating. And like, to me, it's insane because I'll probably do at least two or three hours just of interviews or Zoom calls or YouTube videos a day. So it, it naturally comes to me that, of course, you're going to talk a lot and you're going to hone that skill, put in the reps. But for the average person, they're not doing it. And so understand that if you decide to get good at sales, you're going to be able to run laps around a lot of other people. Yeah. That's, oh, that's so true. I'm so glad you're saying that. Because yeah, you know, it's like, you're a real estate investor, right? But you're also, the you, reality is, whether it's negotiating the deal, whether it's raising capital for the deal, whether it's haggling with the realtor on the other side of the deal, you're a salesperson. Yeah. Who, who applies his salesmanship in the context of real estate investing. I'm a salesman who applies his salesmanship in the context of internet marketing. We both apply our salesmanship in the context of creating content. Even when we're creating value-based content, we don't ask for anything. We're still selling the idea of getting into a, a, a relationship with us intellectually mm -hmm. so that we can develop you. I mean, like maybe I'm letting... I'm pulling back our kimono too much, but like we're trying to build relationships with all of you out there so that at some level we can scale our business and our brand and our value and our, and our bank account. I guess I'll, I'll just admit to that it's part everything. of it too. Yeah. Like we want to grow and we can't mm -hmm. grow if we can't sell. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Like I, it, in a way it is letting the cat out of the bag, but at the same time to me, it seems self-evident and obvious, right? You just lead with value. You provide value. And that's just the start, right? Just to begin the conversation, but then you need to be able to take the conversation to the next level. 
Yeah, and it's, it's interesting because we were talking about social media influencers. And I use the analogy of like the guy who manages to make 200 grand a year with his big Instagram following, you know, peppering a few product placements and, you know, with a few sponsorship deals, but he, his team costs him 180 grand a year just to pay for the content production. So he's making like 20 grand a year. Like he'd be better off flipping burgers at McDonald's. Mm -hmm. that's, that's because he actually hasn't figured out how to take the audience and develop it and, exp and, and staircase it or ascend it or, or deepen the relationship with it or, or put it into a funnel or whatever word you want to use. It's essentially get better at sales. Mm -hmm. And by the way, that's most big lifestyle influencers. Yeah, absolutely. Like, yeah, very few have like actually really- To a really shocking and embarrassing degree, that's most of them. And I know yeah. that and you know that and I figure let's just tell everyone else. Yeah, they haven't developed a back end. They've never really approached it. They've just kept hoping that at some point in time, it would just pay off. And like, that is part of my mindset. But at the same time, you really do need to, you know, like, there's no sense in not capitalizing on it today as well. And so I think one thing that I personally did very poor at at the start was capturing contacts, right? It can be really easy to think that subscribers are contacts on YouTube, but they're not. You need to take the relationship one more degree. You need to get an email address. You need to get a phone number. You need some sort of way to get in contact with that person directly. It's not enough because YouTube controls the notifications. And same with every other social media platform. So they're great for the initial development, but at some point you need to take that relationship and escalate it to another platform and you need to be in control of that platform. Amen. Um, man, only because of time, I, I say we have to end with that. I, I suspect we could go for hours because I think we're really like-minded. We're both real estate developers, online or offline or a little bit of both. Yeah. Um, and I have really enjoyed this, man. I'm so glad you came on the show. Yeah, lots of fun. Appreciate it, Jeff. Of course. Um, so how can people go get deeper into your world? Yeah. So everywhere there's social media, I'll be there. So just find me, Matt McKeever on social media, any platform, doesn't matter. YouTube's my biggest one. So definitely love it when people hit me up on YouTube and you can definitely get my attention and my DM still on Instagram or in the YouTube comments. So if you want to just kind of get top of mind, there's there, or you can find links to emails and all that in those different bios. So again, it's the internet. If you want to find me, you will. Yeah, and I know for, from experience that we, you can get Matt's attention in his Instagram DMs because I'm pretty sure that's how I got your attention to come on the show. Yeah, uh, yeah, makes sense. Yeah, and, uh, and you said you have the largest real estate focused uh, YouTube channel in Canada, right? Yep, yeah, so it's kind of fun being Canadian because you can throw around statistics like that because again, Canadians seem always just a little bit slower to adopt a lot of the fast moving technology. So, I put out a video every single day on YouTube and again, just free content. We're just focused on providing value and uh, we're really just trying, really what I'm trying to do is I'm 35 now. I started investing back when I was 25. I'm just building the YouTube channel I wish 25 year old Matt would have been able to watch because I know what he would have been capable of with this information and knowledge. That's so funny, man. That's literally, you just described to a T what I'm doing with my YouTube channel. It's just, what do I wish that somebody had, it's not, not what did I wish somebody had told me because it's all stuff that somebody told me. Like I'm not innovating intelligence. Mm -hmm. I just repeat what I've learned, but I wish it's what somebody had organized for me. Yeah. Into one central repository of knowledge. So I wouldn't have had to go to a 200 different books and 500 different mentors and 250 different live events that I had to pay to travel to and just get it all in one place. So I, uh, I just subscribed to your channel. Appreciate so, it, Jeff. At least you're plus one for the day. Hey, <laughs> thanks again for coming on the show. I appreciate your time so much. Matt McKeever, everyone, uh, check him out online. He's got, I'm looking at his channel right now. It's like rich with amazingness. And uh, yeah, think long term. I think that's the takeaway here. It's all about impact and legacy. Beautiful. All right. Well, this is Millionaire Secrets signing off. Thanks again, Matt. Thank you for watching Millionaire Secrets. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with your friends and leave us a comment below. And don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications so you know whenever we release a new episode. 
Also, if you want to learn the fastest way to become a millionaire in the new economy, click the link in the description below to claim your free copy of my book, The Millionaire Shortcut. And don't forget, Millionaire Secrets is available on all the major podcast platforms as well. Subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts so you can listen on the go. Thanks for watching.